Welcome to a press conference sponsored by the Center for Security Policy. My name is Frank Gaffney. I'm the center's founder and executive chairman, and very proud to be uh, both a member of uh, what we call the Team B3 that has produced this important work that we're here to discuss today with several other leaders and members of the team entitled the CCP is at war with America. It is a product of a process that has a bit of um, history, I think quite important history at that. Back in 1976, a Team B was established to provide a second opinion on the then prevailing view that detente with the Soviet Union was not simply advisable, but a very salutary thing to do for the national security of the United States. Um, a Team B that was established to take a hard look at all of the classified information in that case in the Central Intelligence Agency's um, data about the Soviet threat came to a very different conclusion. It helped inform uh, the decisions that the American people took in 1980 to reverse course uh, in favor of uh, the Reagan strategy of peace through strength. And um, well, as he put it, we win, they lose in terms of taking down the Soviet Union. In 2010, the Center for Security Policy commissioned uh, another Team B exercise, uh, Team B2, we called it. Um, General Boykin, uh, one of our speakers today was its uh, co-chairman as he is for this exercise. Uh, its focus was on the official narrative about Sharia, the Islamic doctrine uh, that uh, commands its adherence to engage in jihad. Um, the Team B came to a very different view than that this was not a problem or could be safely ignored. Um, and I think it's stood the test of time ever since. Um, we are thrilled to be able to present to you today uh, the results of a third Team B exercise that uh, we'll talk more about um, with our uh, two co-chairmen and one of its most uh, important members on the science side. Uh, and uh, we'll get concluding comments from um, the chairman of the Committee on the Present Danger China, a team that has been doing enormously important work in this battle space. Let me introduce each of them um, in turn as I call upon them. Uh, our first sp speaker will be the co-chairman, a former member of Congress and US ambassador to the Netherlands, Pete Hoekstra. Uh, Pete is these days, I'm very pleased to say, the chairman of the Center for Security Policy's advisory board. But for this purpose, um, his most important credential perhaps uh, was his years of service on the House Intelligence Committee as both its chairman and its ranking member. Um, he was present at the uh, inception of this effort and has been hugely important throughout. And I'm very pleased to turn the floor over to Congressman Pete Hoekstra for his opening comments. Thank you, Frank. I think uh, I'd like to applaud the Center you know, for Security Policy for this project uh, that you have put out and that you've sponsored uh, to really highlight the threat from the CCP. And that from the CCP standpoint, they are at war with the United States. They want to dislodge the United States from its premier position around the world. Uh, and they want to replace the United States with their government, the CCC, the CCP, the Communist Chinese Communist Party. You know, this effort that we've gone through, as you and I brainstormed and thought about it at the beginning, uh, was a response to what we saw as a massive failure by a massive intelligence failure by the US government, but especially by the US intelligence community. A failure in terms of identifying the need to collect on Chinese bio weapon, uh, 
pro bio, bio weapons programs. You know, we've known for an extended period of time that China has been engaged in these types of programs, but when the intelligence community developed its stack, its deck of priorities as to what it was going to be monitoring and trying to get insights on, the Chinese bioweapons program never made the list. So as the COVID virus came forward and questions were starting to be asked, the intelligence community was ill-prepared to deal with the challenge that it faced. When it did finally start to analyze this, the analysis was weak and it was narrowly focused, you know, saying, well, we really can't determine where this virus came from. Uh, we don't believe the Chinese had any foreknowledge of that. And as we went through that process and evaluated the work of the intelligence community, we said, this is a real significant problem. It is a significant issue. It's time for a team B proposal. The work of many of the experts on this team have identified three critical findings. We believe that there is sufficient and compelling evidence that the COVID virus came from the Wuhan laboratory, that it was manipulated uh, in the Wuhan laboratory. It's difficult to determine at this point whether the virus escaped or whether it was intentionally released uh, by the Chinese. Uh, we can't reach an answer on that. But what we can conclude with, again, compelling evidence is that the CCP facilitated the release of this virus on a pandemic scale to the rest of the world. It facilitated the travel of millions of Chinese from China, even as it was locking down Wuhan. It never collaborated with international organizations in terms of sharing with them their, the CCP's full knowledge of what was happening in the early stages of the pandemic, actually using international organizations to spread misinformation about well, you know, this didn't come from the lab, it developed naturally, and also stating early on that, you know, human to human transmission was very, very difficult, facilitating the early spread of this virus, which was their objectives, their objective to do significant damage to the US, to our allies in Europe, uh, and so forth. You know, the process now of this effort, this is only the beginning. As you said, we need to identify to the American people and to much of the rest of the world exactly how dangerous the CCP is. And we also have to go through a process of holding them accountable for what they have unleashed to the rest of the world. Thanks, Frank. Congressman Hoekstra, thank you. Um, and most especially uh, your insights into the sort of systemic problems that the intelligence community has uh, at the moment, uh, the politicization of it, the, the some would argue weaponization of it against us um, is a, a very important contribution to the program, <clears throat> notably in your introduction to this book, The CCP is at War with America, which you co-authored with our next speaker, who is General William Jerry Boykin, United States Army retired Lieutenant General. Let me get his rank correctly. Um, he has served with great distinction, uh, I believe some 36 years in the uniform of the United States Army. During the course of that, um, he not only <clears throat> was among the most highly decorated special operators in our nation's history, uh, both as a warrior and as a commander of the most elite units in our military. But he also served um, in various capacities and in various ways with and in the intelligence community itself, uh, notably in his last duty station as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. Um, General Boykin is a member of our Committee on the Present Danger China, as is uh, Congressman Hoekstra. 
he is uh, a executive vice president at the moment at a terrific organization, the Family Research Council. Um, and we are deeply grateful for the service he rendered as the co-chairman of this Team B3 project. And we look forward to your comments, sir. Welcome. General Boykin, are you there? Yes, I there you are. Welcome. Had not unmuted myself, but uh, I uh, thanks for the great presentation, Ambassador. And uh, let me just start where uh, where you were there um, by saying that uh, we can't say it too frequently that China and the Chinese Communist Party are at war with America. That needs to be repeated until Americans begin to accept that as a reality. As we dug into this, uh, this Team B3 report here and, and, and started uh, really finding out what was going on, uh, it, it, there were some shocking results that came out of that. And I think the ambassador laid out a couple of things there that were very, very important for Americans to understand. See, uh, I used to testify before the committee uh, when the ambassador was uh, either the uh, chairman or the ranking member of the Intel committee. I used to go in there and testify. And, but one of the things that we learned was that, uh, that intelligence really drives foreign policy. It's, it drives it and it supports it. And, and what we've done now since the time of uh, two administrations ago when Barack Obama was president, we've weaponized we clearly, we have weaponized our intelligence. And I believe, and I think the ambassador was saying sort of the same thing, that uh, the intelligence community has lost its focus. Uh, there is no way that the intelligence community could not know that uh, that virus was developed in the Wuhan lab. Uh, it's, it's anecdotal evidence, but I think that it is also... Uh, reasonable for us to assume that the uh, intelligence community knew that it was coming out of that lab, or if they didn't know that it was malfeasance on their part. Now, China uh, has an absolute goal of, uh, of being the supreme power within the, the entire world. Uh, they not only want to be the greatest military power, and by the way, they're building the largest, most sophisticated military in the world right now. They're, right now they're building it and we're helping them pay for it. But uh, I think we need to recognize that uh, it's not just conventional maneuver warfare. It's not just kinetic warfare. They have uh, a lot of tricks up their sleeve. And when you go back and read the report by the two colonels that came out in 1998, Chinese colonels uh, called unrestricted warfare, you see the rest of the picture in addition to their new aircraft carriers and their increasing uh, military budget and in in those things. So they are clearly at war with us and our military is uh, in decline right now, I'm sad to say, because of uh, the policies of the administration. And so we are becoming more and more vulnerable to these things that uh, China is trying to do. Uh, either the conventional uh, systems that they are building or the those things that would fall into the uh, category of, uh, of, of sort of uh, soft power, if you will. But the uh, bi biological warfare that uh, we have seen as a result of this, uh, uh, of this release of the COVID-19 virus, uh, just think about uh, what that is. It's a precursor to things that could be a heck of a lot worse than that. We just need to understand that that could have been a test run as far as I'm concerned. We don't put that in the report but I think that could have been a test run. I think that it's entirely feasible, and I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I think it is entirely feasible that it was a test run. And I don't think the Chinese were quite prepared for how successful it was in terms of killing over a million people in America. So uh, I hope that we can get this report in the hands of every government official, uh, 
present as well as future. And, uh, and those people who are, uh, are, are going to be running for uh, national offices, I think that this is something that uh, they should be uh, very engaged in trying to understand what this report says and understand the context of it and understand what it portends for the future and if they're gonna run for a federal office. That's it, Frank. Aaron Boykin, thank you. Uh, really important points. Um, I'm particularly appreciative <clears throat> that you have connected the dots here to this challenge that we're facing of just simply being adequately aware of the magnitude of the danger that uh, is upon us and that worse may well be in the offing. A man who knows perhaps as much as anybody in the United States about the, well, nature of the capabilities behind and the dangers associated with biological warfare is our next and very important contributor to the Team B3 project, Dr. Stephen Hatfill. Um, he has been uh, throughout his distinguished career uh, in government and uh, working with the government involved in uh, biological warfare threats, uh, their analysis, uh, defenses against them. And I think he really does represent uh, a, an extraordinary uh, expertise, which was manifest uh, particularly in the third chapter of the CCP is at war with America, uh, which drills down on the science behind our theory of the case, which is that uh, this did in fact come out of a laboratory in the biological warfare program of China and was deliberately unleashed on this country and the rest of the world. Uh, Dr. Hatfield was uh, for much of the uh, year 2020 directly involved in the White House effort to contend with this pandemic. Um, we wanna thank him for that service as well as that he rendered to the Team B3 and welcome him to the uh, press conference at this point. Sir, over to you. Yes, it's, uh, the evidence is pretty clear at this time. If we draw two columns of laboratory origin or natural outbreak, there is no direct evidence for a natural spillover from an infected animal into the human population, more specifically at the area where the Chinese called the epicenter was the uh, uh, live food market in Wuhan. This virus appeared out of nowhere. It cannot have an evolutionary line that can be traced back. And its ability to bind to human cells is exceeded by its ability to bind to its natural host, which we assume is a, is a bat a Chinese horseshoe bat or another type of uh, specimen. This goes completely against what we know about the coronaviruses jumping from animals to man. Early human cases were occurring in Wuhan that it had no contact whatsoever with this natural uh, live food market. In addition, several months ago, partial sequences of 13 early epidemic viruses were recovered from the cloud, the Google cloud. The Chinese had deleted these. And these viral sequences from what can be ascertained are not representative of the viruses that were circulating in the uh, live food market in Wuhan early in the epidemic. So even the Chinese themselves have now backed away as the live food market being the epicenter and the start for patient zero. Um, early 2020, Chinese physicians started doing serological surveys, hundreds and hundreds of patients to assess the prevalence rates of SARS-CoV-2 uh, antibodies. 
they neglected to have any form of occupational data associated with this, or if they did, they haven't published it. This would have added great evidence for an animal origin, but it's non-existent. Um, these laboratories, especially in Wuhan, have a long history of lax biological safety. They've had uh, failed inspection problems, and this is including their brand new uh, biosafety level four facility in Wuhan. Um, right after the time and during the time of initial outbreak, the CCP had extensive databases of archived viral sequences, the genetic blueprints, if we can say, deleted. Um, this includes eight index genomes, 174 index and inception, patient samples. Hospitals were ordered to destroy any live virus samples they might have from early COVID cases. And none of this has ever been given over to outside investigators. Uh, a laboratory in Shanghai had sequenced the virus early and they released the genetic blueprints to the world through the internet. That laboratory was subsequently almost immediately closed uh, for rectification. Um, it's, it's, these laboratories have, we now know, uh, a history of what are called gain of function experiments, trying to make these coronaviruses more infectious to man or more lethal to man. Um, they learned some of this information back in 2005 uh, from U.S. investigators in North Carolina, and um, as well as inserting genetic information in a seamless fashion so it would be undetectable using reverse genetic techniques. Uh, these were almost certainly tested on humanized mice, mice containing humanized tissue, uh, which is surrogate for primate and, and human experiments. Most particularly is two areas of the genome that are very suspicious. One is called the furin cleavage site, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is the only beta Saber coronavirus that shows this furin sequence in its genetic instructions. That enables the spike protein, which binds to human cells to unfurl, much like a Christmas tree when you bring it home and there's tape around it. It's like cutting the tape, the protein unfurls and becomes active. At the same time, a portion of this is cleaved off Yes, one fragment. And we now know that that fragment can circulate in the blood and it contains the instructions to manufacture a, pro a protein that is structurally and functionally similar to a biological warfare agent called Staphylococcal enterotoxin B. Uh, Tons of this stuff were produced during uh, the early U.S. offensive program, which ended in 1969. Um, this appears to, this has no discernible evolutionary origin. This virus just suddenly appeared with these capabilities. Um, in addition, we need to look at how China has behaved. It had, the CCP has initiated an extensive public information campaign to minimize the fact of any sort of suggestion for a laboratory origin of these viruses. In addition, it lied and said these viruses were poorly transmitted person to person and convinced the WHO, the World Health Organization, that this was the case when it wasn't. They knew very early on 
This was highly transmissible. They locked Wuhan down and several other major cities. They prohibited traffic in and out of these cities. And at the same time, they facilitated, in some cases, international travel from, from people from Wuhan. This was intentional. And essentially, technically, it's dissemination of a biological agent. We were attacked in this fashion. At the same time, there was a major effort to purchase the world supply of protective equipment, personal protective equipment needed to handle the pandemic. When it came time for other nations to need this, uh, there wasn't enough to go around. So all in all, we some of us think that this virus actually broke out much, much earlier, perhaps in September of 2019, until it got out of control. There's a lot of other points we could discuss, both in China's behavior and about the virus itself. Um, I sat on the fence for over a year, uh, quite refusing to believe it had a laboratory origin until the circumstantial evidence is so overwhelming that it leaves no other recourse but to assume that, yes, it did come from a laboratory. We won't know until a proper investigation is done, which has not been the case to date. It is now up to China to prove to the world that it didn't come from a laboratory, rather than the world trying to prove that it did. Dr. Hatfield, thank you very much, uh, both for this uh, excellent sort of treatment of the scientific uh, underpinnings of the Team B report and for uh, all the work that you've done that uh, informs it. Uh, we're going to complete this program and I wanna just emphasize that um, we are going to invite your questions. If you could put them into the Q&A feature of uh, this Zoom call, uh, we will get to as many of them as we can here momentarily, but we're gonna wrap up with um, Brian Kennedy, uh, as I mentioned, the chairman of the Committee on the Present Danger China, I have the privilege of being his vice chairman. It is um, doing incredibly important work, a project of our Center for Security Policy that um, has been at the forefront, I think, of making the case that the CCP is indeed at war with America and trying to equip Americans uh, with what to do about all that. Um, Brian is uh, the former president of the Claremont Institute and currently the president of the American Strategy Group. Um, we're delighted to have him with us to be the cleanup batter for this presentation. Brian, over to you. Well, thank you, Frank. Uh, and thank you, Frank, for the leadership you've had of both the Center for Security Policy and the Committee on the Present Danger of China with me. It's a, it's a great pleasure working with you on that. It, is, uh, it, it seems to me, first of all, this is a very important book. And uh, Dr. Hatfield's contribution especially is worth reading just for that alone. I think his treatment of the science of all of this and the logic behind it is something we haven't seen anywhere in the news, anywhere in the public policy world, anywhere in the press. Uh, and I think the strategic analysis by Ambassador Hoekstra and Jerry Boykin, General Boykin's excellent analysis also is extremely important to read. I would also add that it's a sign of a certain kind of intellectual corruption in this country that three years into this, a private group of people had to produce this document. 
as a way of educating both citizens and policymakers about what's going on. It's as if no one who is part of official Washington, whether it's the intelligence community or the defense community or any of the scientific agencies responsible for disseminating information to the American people had the courage to talk about this. The Chinese in May of 2019 declared a people's war against the United States. They did that in their official Chinese Communist Party publications, the People's Daily, uh, and they were telling the people of China that they were going to be engaging in war with the United States. Now, they're not specific on what the, the tenor of that war is going to look like, but they do say they're going to engage in a people's war and that the people of China should be prepared for a radical plan of action for what might transpire. Now, cause and effect, we're not suggesting that there's a perfect parallel here. So we're not trying to prove anything by this, but within six months of that, six months, COVID-19 starts spreading, it would appear throughout the world. And both the United States and the world suffer the consequences of that virus going from China to the United States. Our world has been altered. And over those three years, we have not seen a public acknowledgement by the US government, by the US intelligence community of what this book that we have just published argues. And that strikes me as terribly irresponsible on the part of our government. And so this book is a much needed remedy for that. Uh, I would also say that one reason that we may have seen uh, for this not to have happened, for, for the intelligence community not to have remarked on this, is that for the better part of 30 years, I believe big parts of our government have been partners with the Chinese Communist Party, trying to bring them into the community of nations, sharing with the Chinese Communist Party, People's Republic of China, all sorts of technology, scientific technology especially, that the United States has produced, sharing it with Communist China. They have, during that period, had official delegations sharing that kind of technology, but also the intelligence community in this country has watched while the Chinese Communist Party has stolen tr literally trillions of dollars of intellectual property from American industry over that period of time. And they've done nothing about it. And this people's war that I mentioned didn't really occur didn't, wasn't mentioned, didn't, didn't happen until the Trump administration had the temerity to say that we're gonna hold communist China to account for their theft of intellectual property. And so the US government has not yet caught up with a growing sentiment in this country that we have to take the threat from communist China seriously, that when they say they're at war with us, that that's real, that when they engage in things like biological warfare against us vis-a-vis -vis the COVID-19 virus, we ought to do something about that. And so this document is something we're going to try to get into the hands of as many citizens and policymakers as possible. And we would invite uh, large numbers of, of people running for office in the fall current congressmen, current senators, to avail themselves of this Team B3 uh, so that they might have further in-depth briefings to really understand what it is we were, we were arguing in this document about the kind of information they should know and the kind of steps that ought to be taken. So let me close by thanking Frank Gaffney for all of his fine work 
in uh, making sure that this became a reality. This was discussed, you know, some six months ago, the need for this to happen. And uh, I myself am very proud to, to be a colleague of his to bring this to a reality. So let, let me conclude by that, Frank. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That's deeply appreciated. Um, uh, let me just make a couple of administrative uh, announcements. Uh, we're going to take some questions now. Uh, we have to ring off probably about uh, 12, uh, 11, uh, 50 or so uh, due to some other responsibilities of the team. But I want to make sure that we get to as many questions as we can. And we have some excellent ones in the queue. Um, you can find the book. Uh, the CCP is at war with America at CCP at war.com. Um, We're going to have a longer uh, presentation with additional members of the uh, Team B3 group uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern time this afternoon. Um, we invite you to participate in that as well for a deeper dive on a number of these topics than we can do in the shortness of time at the moment. PresentDangerChina.org is the website of the Committee on the Present Danger China, which is sponsoring uh, its, its regular weekly uh, featured uh, webinar about the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, that's where you can register, presentdangerchina.org, register to participate in that call at one o'clock, probably run till about 2.30. Uh, with that all said, let me um, ask a couple of questions, if I may, uh, that uh, have emanated from this uh, audience. And I would, again, invite more to be put into the Q&A feature of Zoom. There is a very serious question about um, the point that Steve Hatfield, I think, made, uh, the degree to which the United States government itself contributed materially to the Chinese biological warfare program. And it's got essentially two features to this question. One is um, an assessment of the impact of that help, financial, technological, and otherwise, and also whether such help is still continuing, uh, notably in American labs and research centers and, uh, and the like, uh, academic institutions. Um, uh, Dr. Heffel, maybe I could ask you to take the first cut at this. Hear me? Yes, sir. The, um... Cooperation goes back to roughly around 2005, where senior Chinese personnel uh, learned how to do reverse genetics and um, the ability to create humanized mice uh, in a university in North Carolina. Um, our gain of function experiments in this country were brought to a halt by the consensus of the scientific community as being too dangerous. Um, the Chinese continued their gain of function experiments, trying to make known pathogens uh, more infectious and more deadly. Um, without proper vetting, this was funded uh, by the United States through an intermediary um, organizations, EcoHealth Alliance, inadvertently by uh, USAID. Uh, these gain-of-function experiments continued in China in spite of a U.S. embargo. When the documents started to be recovered from the NIH, Dr. Fauci, um, it became quite clear that several departments in the State Department, whose job was to prevent the transfer 
of foreign technology, uh, we're trying to cover up uh, any suggestions of a laboratory origin of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, their personnel underneath uh, these leaders were becoming more and more adamant that it did have, in fact, a laboratory origin. But the leadership there was trying to minimize it because they knew that there had been inappropriate funding. Why you would give money to a nation with a known advanced biological weapons program to work on gain of function activities is simply beyond the pale of understanding. Amen. Let me turn, uh, if I may, to a question that I think is on a lot of people's minds. And that is uh, something Brian Kennedy touched on. Um, and Brian, you may want to speak to it, but uh, General Boykin, I particularly would like to get your thoughts on it. As someone who has long experience in not only the intelligence business, but the counter intelligence business. And that is the extent to which this penetration of our government, uh, the elite capture, as Peter Schweitzer has called it, uh, the Chinese call it that, um, and uh, the penetration of these institutions uh, really represents a national security threat to the country uh, that uh, raises questions about our ability to respond to those that the Chinese are posing to us in other respects. Yeah, Frank, I, I think the average American uh, would be shocked if they knew just how deeply penetrated we are at every level in America, you know, it's, uh, it, and it's not just uh, industry or academia, it is, it's our government as well. We, we have pen been penetrated by the Chinese Communist Party in our government. And, and you will find that uh, many of the contractors, for example, that, uh, that support our government uh, have uh, what are clearly Chinese agents uh, working within those, uh, those contractors. So, um, and, and the fact of the matter is that uh, our counterintelligence efforts uh, are just really not ferreting these people out. That's not to say that we don't catch one every now and then and we make an issue of it, but the reality is I don't think we're putting forth our best effort to try and find out who these people are and what they're up to. And we certainly don't have any kind of policy with regards to proper and appropriate screening of these people before we let those that are coming to this country from China to uh, go to school, to working in our industries and that type of thing. Uh, we're not screening them very well. And uh, I, th I think that it is a national security issue of uh, great proportion that we are so infiltrated in America, yet we are really not doing anything about it. Uh, Congressman Hoekstra, let me ask you if I could about the issue of the priority being given, as General Boykin just suggested, or lack of priority, maybe but more accurately, to understanding the biological warfare doctrine uh, the plans, uh, the programs, and the capabilities of the Chinese Communist Party? Well, Frank, you know, I think uh, as a number of the panelists have mentioned, we've been well aware that China has been involved in a bioweapons program for 20, maybe up to 30 years. Uh, we realize that, <clears throat> you know, the U.S. government was involved. We also realized that they, uh, they're they great at stealing our technology and our information and our research. So you would have thought that this would have been a number one priority for our intelligence community, uh, because as a country, we have, you know, we have defunded much of our bioweapons defense program, you know, so that if there were a bio attack against the United States, the United States would be prepared. So we not only defunded that program, we also, you know, 
didn't put as a priority researching and trying to gain intelligence on what other people were doing, even though we knew they were engaged in those types of activities. It really is, I think, as Jerry said, malfeasance on the part of uh, our intelligence community as part of our government. Why? Uh, because we have been infiltrated and since we passed uh, and allowed China into the World Trade Organization, we believe that, we naively believe that working with China, we would change China's behavior and they would become more like us. In reality, what allowing them into the World Trade Organization and treating them as someone we could effectively work with, they saw that as a massive opening to change, to you know, toughen their behavior and to really be a cancer, uh, not only within the US, but within the West uh, that would undermine us. It really is malfeasance. I fear you're right. Let me ask you, um, Brian Kennedy, maybe first and foremost, and others, if you care to join in. The question is, uh, how close are we to a kinetic war with China? And let me just add, isn't the attack that the Team B3 has determined was indeed mounted by the Chinese Communist Party against us uh, starting back in late 2019? a biological form of a kinetic attack, a murderous attack, an attack uh, that is, has been mentioned has killed a million Americans so far. Uh, Brian, first to you. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Frank. Um, I think we should take a step back though and say, you know, do the Chinese think of themselves at war with us? And the answer as we've said is yes. Today they spend, the Chinese spend, some 13 to $16 billion a year on intelligence operations in the United States. Why do they spend that money? Because they wish to control the United States. And one could argue they're doing a pretty good job of it today. As other panelists have mentioned, they penetrated the United States, they know what we do from a scientific point of view. They've co-opted our laboratories. They've co-opted parts of the government. They've co-opted our political and financial elites, especially on Wall Street. They were able to conduct this biological warfare attack against us and manage throughout that process our response to the point where it's taken three years to just understand what you just said, that there was a real kinetic attack against the United States. And they are still capable of managing our response. And so, yes, war has started. It is a kinetic, it is a kinetic attack against the United States. Americans have died. What the purpose of this effort is to do is to make sure that Americans understand that and that we respond the right way, that we understand we're at war and that we ought to do something about that. And that begins with having the political leadership to join us to understand that we're at war and to take the, the steps necessary to make sure we have a military that can respond adequately, that we have an economy that is no longer dependent on communist China, and that we as a nation can believe again in the defense of our civilization and all that entails. Brian, I think Great. we're gonna to have to leave it at that. Uh, General, was that you? No, that was, uh, this was Pete. Pete, uh, last comment quickly, if you yeah, would, sir. That, that was an time. awesome uh, explanation. And thank you for that. <clears throat> I'd add just one point. China has gone through three years of this and the world has not demanded accountability because of the steps that were just outlined that they've been able to do to control the narrative. No accountability, amazing, with 6 million people have died. Yes.
this is our purpose going forward. And I want to thank all of the Team B members, uh, both those that were present for this press conference, as well as those that uh, will be joining us uh, for the next program at one o'clock this afternoon, uh, the Committee on the Present Danger China webinar I mentioned a moment ago. Um, please join us for that, for a more in-depth conversation about all of these topics and others. Um, we will have uh, an expanded team present. Uh, register at presentdangerchina.org for it. Um, if uh, you're catching up with this video uh, after the fact, um, the video of the committee's webinar will be um, posted in due course. Uh, let me conclude by simply saying thank you from the bottom of my heart to um, our co-chairman, Pete Hoekstra and Jerry Boykin, um, to Dr. Stephen Hatfill, um, indispensable um, participant in this project, and of course, to Brian Kennedy, to all of you for your excellent remarks uh, on this occasion. And um, I hope that uh, the quality of those remarks and the various presentations will inspire everyone listening and those that you're communicating with to take a look at the book itself, the CCP is at war with America. Uh, you can find it at ccpatwar.com. Um, and uh, please stay apprised of what the Team B3 is going to be doing next, especially with respect to this vital task now of briefing the report and preparing those who seek to represent us in elective office. Uh, both incumbents and challengers of all political stripes to be equipped to understand that the Chinese Communist Party is indeed at war with America and what they will tell us they're prepared to do about it. On behalf of all of our team and uh, the Center for Security Policy's superb staff, including Matt Franklin, who has facilitated this important uh, briefing, I wanna say thank you and I hope you'll stay in touch.